So, the, so the, the, the serpent, therefore, the snake, throughout history, has uh, symbolized some form of evil because of that, yes? And uh, another thing about the snake, you know, if we could go into it when I'm studying, um, did a couple of courses on evil, which is studying evil is quite an interesting thing. Um, the, the, the snake or the serpent is a peculiar animal. It's one of the few animals that lives in the three sections of planet Earth. Underground, above ground, on ground, and in water. Not many animals have that kind of versatility, <laughs> you know? And, um, and other things about the snake too. It regenerates itself. You cut it in two, the head grows a tail and the tail grows a head. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a peculiar animal, you know. But anyway, the serpent bites the people. Snakes bite the people. It is a fatal, it is, yeah? It's fatal. Um, and so they cry to Moses, Moses goes to God. God says, make a serpent of brass, put it on a pole, and tell the individuals to look on it. Look on it. If you go and you look on it, you will be healed. Yeah? And that gives us some clarity on what it means to have faith in God. Yeah? So, how does that give us clarity of what it means to have faith in God? That's all. Oh, yes, sir. So what were they to believe? Right. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, yeah, hold on there. Yeah, no, hold on. What's the question? What's the question? The question is, how does that help us to understand what faith in God is? <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, we want some specific thinking now. Yes, dear. Obedience. Obedience. Now, what are they obeying? The instruction. What was the instruction? The instruction was simply to what? To look, it didn't require belief. No. Belief is good? Of course it is. But the instruction was simply with this. Tell those that are bitten with the snake to what? Go and look and they will be healed. Are you following me? Why will they be healed? Because they obeyed. Yeah? Now remember from long, long ago we says, the nation of Israel, spiritually, they are in their infancy. Sort of like teaching six or seven year old. How do you teach a seven year old or a six year old about faith in God? What language will you use to teach a six-year-old what faith in God is? You following my question? What language would you use? How would you teach your six, a six-year-old about faith? What would you say to that six-year-old? You'd say, obey. You would say, just as how you are to obey your mother and father, you obey God. And then you will tell them that to obey God is to obey what God says. Isn't that how they obey you? Can children obey their parents if the parent hasn't spoken something? You know, surprisingly, God is the only 
only in religion people have this notion about obedience that you can obey God and God hasn't said anything about the thing that you're obeying. <laughs> Are you with me? <laughs> you know? To obey God is to obey the instructions of God. If there are no instructions from God, then what you are engaging in is not an act of obedience. So Israel in its spiritual infancy is being taught what faith looks like. What does it look like? God says, look up on that pole, the serpent of brass, and when you look at it, you will be healed. You don't need to rationalize it and say, wow, well, is there some power in that? What kind of power is there? What? Are you with me? Yeah? The result, which we may call the blessing, is just based upon the raw act of obeying God. So now. But the serpent now became a symbol. I mean the serpent of brass, rather, became a symbol. It became the symbol of healing to this day. So, for medicine, the serpent, I mean rather, the symbol for healing is what? That serpent, you see? You, you never seen that? See? The, the emblem, yeah? It's, 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 over the, it's, 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 it's the emblem for healing. No, it's also going to go a little further because when you go to John, so go over to the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. I'm sorry, dear. Yeah, <laughs> you know. I, 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 yeah, yeah it would, well, I'll ask the others to come forward. But, you know, let's spread out. I will stay here. They can hear me. But um, when I walk down, I see who is reading from who is not reading. So you're good. You're fine. John chapter 3, 14 and 15. You, you there? Read it for me. Go ahead, brother. John 3, 14 and 15. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. No, stop right there, brother. We go, yeah. So, the verse 16 now is a continuation of verse 15. But notice here now. Notice the connection. In the same way that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, and those who looked on that serpent were healed, here we are told that in a similar fashion, the Son of Man, who is Jesus, will be lifted up, and whoever what now? Believes in him will be, will be healed or be saved. So faith in God now, with regards to Jesus Christ, here now, it requires what? Believing. See? You go a step further now. So, to believe, actually, to be in the wilderness, they only had to look up. Now, we have to look up too, but in addition to that, we have to believe. We have to believe in him. Yeah? Now, what does it mean to believe in him? Again, we go back to the fundamental matter of obedience. To believe... In him, among other things, requires believing what he says. Yeah? Requires us to believe what he says. Yeah? But it is more than just believing what he says. Here now, it is believing in him. That is, believing in his power, in his person, in all that he encompasses. That he is the savior. He is the healer of our sins. 
Yeah? So to believe in him. Is strong. I, I, you know, I'm thinking of. I am thinking of our politics. Can't um, get away from our political situation today. And I'm thinking of the extreme groups. You know. The extreme groups. And they'll say they believe. They believe in the president. That's great. Nothing is wrong with that. I only wish we Christians. That our belief in Christ was just as strong. <laughs> Are you with me? <laughs> you know, this is, you know, I said, um, you know, I, I saw an interview where they interviewed um, this African American lady about some of the things that um, the president said. And she says, no, he didn't say that. It's fake news. <laughs> you with me? Say, no, 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 no. He didn't say that. I don't believe that. That's just, you guys put that together. That's fine. I'm, I'm not knocking that. That's not our discussion. But the point is that it's an indication of the depth of her what? Belief in him. So to believe in Jesus, I'm just saying, it is that kind of belief that we are to have in Jesus Christ. That kind of belief that is so strong that nothing will shake us. Or divert our minds or in any way infringe upon us in such a way that we say, man, I think I was misled. Say, no. Jesus has done too much for us to be shaken or for our belief in him to be shaken. Yeah? So just as the serpent was the healer, the means of God's healing, here Jesus is the means of our salvation. But here's the problem with the serpent now. Now Jesus is the real deal. We understand that. But the serpent of brass, and we have to go back to the serpent of brass, the serpent of brass gives us a lesson why in the Ten Commandments we are told we are not to make any graven images of any heavenly beings. Yeah? We're not to make any graven images. And the churches traditionally have understood that to say that there is a danger in images because the image starts out only as a representation. <laughs> Are you with me? The image, when it is first drawn or built or being used, is just to remind us. It is a reminder. You know? But over time, over time, that image takes on different meanings. Until eventually, the image is no longer a reminder, but now becomes uh, the thing that it was reminding us of. Yeah? So, let's go over to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 18 Second Kings chapter 18, now the, the if, and we want to read from verse, verse 1 to 4. It's a beautiful um, little historical, what do we call that now, encapsule of uh, what this great, the reformation that this great king brought about in Israel. Second Kings 18, from 1 to 4. Zulene, you have it? Read for us. Mm -hmm. Son of Ella, king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. He removed the 
Mm -hmm. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called ne Nehemiah. Right. Thank you. So, <laughs> get the point. You can see there? So, here is it now. King Hezekiah, who brought about a spiritual revival in the nation of uh, Judea. Of Judah, rather. Okay? A spiritual revival of getting the nation to return to God. And it tells you how he broke down all of the false um, religious um, worship places and idols and all of that, including... The bronze serpent. Because it says up to that point, what were the people doing? They were making offerings to the bronze serpent. Isn't that amazing? Why were they making offerings to the bronze serpent? Yes, sir. So, who, who, so let's put a little thing here now. Numbers 21, where you read up where it happens, and 2 Kings 18, between the two passages, is 700 years. <laughs> Are you with me? It's a time span of 700 years. Over here, you are in 2 Kings. In Numbers... Israel haven't even gone yet into the promised land. Over in 2 Kings, you've had uh, the period of the judges, which was 400 years. Then you had all of those kings. Yeah? And it is telling you about the work of King Hezekiah. The young man who became king at the age of 25. Tells you his mother's name. And it tells you the kind of reform that he brought about in the nation of Judah. And among the things he did was to break down the, broad, the brazen serpent. Because up to that time, people were offering, making offerings to the brazen serpent. Yeah? Now, when Moses was told to build the brazen serpent, that brazen serpent was only for that moment. For the people who were literally bit by the serpents that God sent among them at that time, they were bitten, they had the, ve the poisonous venom in their bodies, and they were dying. They went out and they looked, they were healed. When they moved <coughs> beyond that, that brazen serpent was just a piece of brass. If you were suffering from tuberculosis or leprosy and you went and you went and you look up at that serpent, it's not going to heal you of your leprosy or tuberculosis or whatever illness that you had. But in the minds of the people, the symbol took on a new meaning. Eh? So that's the power of religious symbols. And people become so attached to the symbols that over time the symbol replaces God. We do that with people as well. Give me an example. Yes. No, anywhere, you know. You say we do that with people. Like a, so let me help you. With, with religious leaders, yes. political leaders. But here is one. You know, Mary, the mother of Jesus. You know, the Bible is very, the Bible is very careful. The scriptures are very careful in how they describe Mary. You see? They're very careful. You have to, when we stay with what the scriptures actually say, we won't have a problem. 
But then if we go beyond what the scripture says, we get onto we get into a into quicksand. The scriptures never describes Mary as the mother of God. Are you with me? It never says Mary the mother of God. You don't see that. In fact, most of the time it just simply says what? Mary. And leaves it there. You see? In the earliest days, I think over in, um, let me just double check that, in, in John chapter 2, I think it says, no, let me see what it says about, uh, this is in the, where Jesus turns water to wine. When the wine was gone out, Jesus' mother, that's what it says. Yeah? Uh, John 2 and verse 3. Jesus' mother came to him and says, they have no wine. <laughs> Are you with me? So, you know, the devil is very subtle, as we learned that from Genesis. Jesus' mother, or you could say the mother of Jesus, same thing. But then John tells us in John chapter 1 and verse 1, that Jesus is God. Are you with me? So, who can say, well, if Mary is the mother of Jesus, and Jesus is God, then Mary is the mother of God. No! Are you with me? That's a stretch, because John tells us over in John 1 and verse 1, that Jesus was God before creation. But Mary was not there before creation. Or in other words, Jesus created Mary. You following me? In the beginning, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. That's John chapter 1 verse 1. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that has been made. That's verses 2 and 3. Yes, sir. When Jesus was lost as a child, mm -hmm. and he was just a priest learning, mm -hmm. he didn't even refer to her as his mother then. No. He says, I thought maybe he did say that, but mother, I mean. No, he, he, yeah, no, we are not saying that he did not recognize her as his mother. We are just simply saying he didn't recognize her as his God. We're just simply saying. The scriptures is very careful in how it this. He, yeah, of course. No. Yeah. The Catholic Church says she is God. It's Mary, the mother of God. Pray for us sinners. <laughs> are you with me? <laughs> the point, you see what is happening so listen we, we, keep in mind keep in mind shh, hold on hold on hold on slow down keep in mind 2nd Kings 18 and verse 4 with the serpent of brass 700 years later or let, me, let me put it another way the day after during the time of Moses they were not making offerings to the serpent of brass. Are you with me? It was just, that's the serpent that was on the pole there. For whatever reason, Moses didn't take it down. Are you with me? It was just left there. Or maybe they took it down and carried it with them. They must have carried it with them because it was over in the promised land. Yeah? Who carried it? We don't know. But it was just a brass, a pole with a brass serpent on top of it. There's nothing more to it. Somewhere down the line, how long? We don't know. I certainly don't know. 
at this moment. They are going to plant it at a place. And they are going to start making offerings to it. See what I'm saying to you? And that's going to continue for another 700 years. For up to 700 years in the time of King Hezekiah who says, no, this thing has gone on too long. This is idolatry. And he tears it down. And the scriptures make sure it tells us. So we are looking at that now. And we are seeing how dangerous it is. One, to have images. Religious images. The image starts out as a reminder of some religious thing. <laughs> Are you with me? But over time, over time, the symbol takes on additional meaning. So we are, I, mean, I choose Mary. So today, in the year 2017, in the Catholic Church, they are only a step away from Mary being declared God. They have been doing it, but it is not yet official. Yeah? It has been a gradual movement. So now, in praying to the saints, one of the most, well, actually every mass, a prayer is offered to Mary, the mother of God. Pray for us sinners because they are praying to Mary to act as an intermediary between the sinner and Jesus Christ. Are you with me? And I'm, yes, sir. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. There's one mediator. One. Very hard to misunderstand one. Yeah? The other thing you will notice, and it is not just church buildings. Church buildings. Whether we understand or not. See? Church buildings. See, originally, the church building was just the building where the church met. You following me? What is the church? The church is the people. The people. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. The church is never, has never been a structure. Yeah? Over time, over time, the building replaced the people. Follow me? Over time, the building replaced the people. So, <laughs> you know, go on websites, go on Churches of Christ websites. Say, I don't know, I'm just going to call a name. Let's say, Fort Worth Church of Christ, Fort Worth, Texas. And they have a picture, the Fort Worth Church of Christ. What is the picture they show you? The building. The building. Yes, sir? That's exactly you know what I'm saying to you. I'm just saying that. In fact, I go a little bit further. So the patch of church of Christ. So we'd like a picture of the church. Sir? 
Yeah, we're trying, we're trying to get you, but you see, there's resistance, or there has been, there was. They say, okay, we want to get a picture of the congregation. But to get a picture of the congregation, folks have to be willing to what? To come out, group together, and we get a group picture. Now, that's what I would like us to have on the website as a Patriarch Church of Christ. You following me? Because, you see, what happens in our speech, in our mind, says... I'm going to the church. And in the whole mindset, I'm going to the church, we're going to the place where the church meets. In our mind, we don't visualize the members. And that we're a part of it. <laughs> yes, brother. You, and you know, it, 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 and there are so many other little, little, little aspects to this. See, so many other little aspects. One of the things we try to get to is for us to see members when we speak of church. I'm going to pray for. Let us pray for the church. I pray for the congregation. Well, what image should we conjure up in our mind? See? That's why I was so happy that we finally got a pictorial directory. That's a directory of our church. That's why we wanted pictures of all of our members. So the next thing which you'll be hearing from me is to say, pray the directory. What do you mean by pray the directory? Have the directory open and you tip flip, you're praying. Here are you. Are you with me? You're praying the members, you have now a directory, 60 or 70 pages of the church family. So you can pray for each, each one. Flip the page. Lord, I'm praying for this. Lord, I'm praying for this. Are you with me? Pray the direction, because that's the church. We, so to get there... We have to force our minds to think that way. Otherwise, we will continue to have a picture of the Pacha building. You know, when folks come in here, oh, for the first time, oh, what a beautiful church. I've heard that so many times from non-members and members. What a beautiful church you have here. You following me? That's what images do to our thinking. So, it's for that reason why when the whole Protestant movement began and the whole notion of going back to the Jerusalem church, going back to the church that was built, the original church, among the things that were argued and debated was the matter of images. So we don't have images on our churches, buildings. As against Catholicism and some of the other mainline denominations. We don't have a statue of quote unquote Peter or Paul or James or John or any of the apostles. There's a reason for that. And the reason is linked to the brazen serpent. We learn from it that over time, what the image was to represent becomes the thing itself. We begin to ascribe power to the representation and lose and be led astray. There are only two images that Jesus authorized in the church. So this is a, what, what do I call them? High upper level question. So what are the two images? You have to think about it. Only two. 
What are they? No. Thank you for the cross. I, I almost forgot that. So while you are thinking about that, while you are thinking about that, thank you so much for the cross. You see, the cross, the cross became a symbol of what? Suffering and shame. Actually, it is really victory over suffering and shame. It became a symbol for that. And so strong is that imagery that we make it into jewelry. We have earrings. We have necklaces with pen. Actually, I've seen some pendants of cross. Man, that thing, they look like it weighs a pound. You know what I'm saying? Heavy. But over time, over time, in addition to that symbol, it's more than a symbol now. It takes on religious power. We use it to, quote unquote, to ward off evil. You see in the movies, what is the answer to Dracula's, um, what's it, what do you call them? The, what is it? Uh, vampires. How do you keep up with a vampire? You have to show him the cross. Yeah? Superstitious nonsense. Yeah? But the thing about, and I said, many people believe that. Yeah? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, so in the in the in the baby's crib. Yeah? You know, to our bed, you know, you have a little necklace with a cross hanging over it, yeah? To to ward off evil spirits. In many motor cars over the over the the rear view are there, yeah? You swing across here to what? To guard you against what? Accidents. Superstitious nonsense. See? That's what, that's the, the power of images and how the devil uses these things to pull away our minds. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. The images pulls your mind. Where should your mind be? Your mi our minds ought not to be on the image. It ought to be on Christ. Well, I, I go a little bit further. Even the paintings of Jesus Christ. Let me show you how imagery is powerful. So Europe, the continent of Europe, became the dominant force in the world. And it is still the dominant force in the world. But in the whole Europeanization of the planet Earth, some changes have to be made. And in those changes, the dominant people must be made to look dominant in every aspect of life. And the most powerful aspect of life is religion. And the religion of Europe is Christianity. So the images of Christianity has to be painted what? White. Including Jesus. How strong is that? Let me tell you how strong it is. Blonde hair, blue eyes. Blonde hair, blue eyes. But here is the point now that... Um, struck me recently, this was last year, on Fox News, one of the leading presenters, and this was when Bill O'Reilly was still there, and she said, Jesus is white. And so the discussion, she said, she could never serve a black Jesus. Now she sees herself as a faithful Christian. Are you with me? Well, but I tell you something. If you were to repaint all of the images of Jesus black, Christianity would, for the most part, die out in this country. That is just how strong and powerful is imagery. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? So the, 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 the point, the, the oldest, yeah. Don't make any images of, of God. You see? And so, the, and you, you know, and, the, you know, it's, 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 um, it's a tool that is used, like anything else. It's a tool that is used and used many times in a bad way or even an evil way. See? So you will notice from Adolf Hitler, you know, the Hitler, um, the Third Reich, was supported. He had the full support of the churches. Are you with me? He had the full support of the churches to exterminate the Jews. Apartheid, South Africa had the full support of the church in Africa. Actually, it's just in the last, to be safe, I'll say in the last 10 years, that the church finally acknowledged publicly that they were wrong to support apartheid, yes? The church of the, the church, the Christian church, that governed South Africa. No, it wasn't Catholic. It's Africaners. The Africaners Church, you know, it was. Yeah? But it had the support of the, 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 um, it, the church there was more Protestant than uh, Catholic. The Catholic Church was there too, but the Church of England, they were all. The Church of England came out a little early and says, hey, no, we're wrong. But they weren't the most powerful church in South Africa. Yes, sir. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Actually, I tell you, I had to. I had to look it up. I. I, I mean, I heard it with my own ears. Are you with me? I'm not, this is not what I, I mean, it was a live interview of one of the, one of the Protestant leaders in, the, in President Trump's um, religious advisory group. There's about 15 to 20 of them make up the group, okay? And the person who was being interviewed is the head of the Baptist church in Dallas. And he said that the President of the United States has a divine right to assassinate the President of North Korea. You heard it on Fox News. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I heard the interview. Yeah? He, 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 I'm not telling you who he is because I researched him. Yeah? He is the, and he has a worldwide television ministry, but he is the, is the pastor for the Baptist Church in Dallas. Very powerful person. I don't remember his name. So much so that I went ahead and printed off the entire group of um, the ministers who are there on the advisory council of um, the religious advisor council to President Trump. The point, yes. So the, the point I'm making here is this, that, you know, <laughs> the, the, the Christian, Christian religion in a whole, you can't, the, 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 the leaders of Christendom have really, don't have a, a good history. Let me put it, let me put, it, put, it, put it to you that way. Don't have a good history in dealing with politi in politics. 
they tend to end up on the wrong side of politics most of the times. All right, well, if you want to go further, the civil rights movement. Yeah? Or even before the civil rights movement. The church, going back to slavery, the church supported slavery. Churches of Christ in the U.S. for the most part don't get involved in civil rights. They don't get involved in social justice. They're always they're on the wrong side of history on that. And the reason for that is because the churches of Christ, certainly in the Midwest and the South, were slave owners. <laughs> Are you with me? They were slave owners. And so, they're just on the wrong side of history. Now, they gave up their slaves and they like all of that, you know. Alexander Campbell did that and all of the others, they did. And they began to speak, some of them spoke out against it. But with that history, they were never at the forefront of fighting for equality for blacks. They, they weren't then and they certainly aren't now. That's one of the reasons you go down there, you still have white churches and black churches in the year 2017. I worship with, the, with what the Brown Church, Church of Christ in, um, what's the name of that town? Hearst, Texas. Lovely, fantastic congregation. At the time when we started, it was about 700 members. Paulette and myself at that time, I think we were the only black family in that church. That was in 1978 to 1980. Once a month, I used to go and visit and preach at the Stop Six Church of Christ in Fort Worth, closer to Dallas, which was an African-American church. S.T.W. Gibbs Jr. was the minister for the church there. 1979, I became the preacher for the Carter Park Church of Christ in Fort Worth. We were the only black family in that church. And I was the preacher. Yeah? Congregation of about 80, 80 to 100 members. Did that for a year. Then we went back to Jamaica. The reason why our churches are divided on racial lines is slavery. See? And how that played out is because of Europe's philosophy. We are Africans or blacks. We're subhuman. So that's it. Are you with me? So hence, uh, you know, when, they, when the Constitution, the forefathers, there's a reason why. But which, one, which one is it? The preamble, all men are created what? Equal. There's a reason why that is written into the Constitution of the nation. See, it's to take us out. The reason for the Civil War was slavery. Because the leader says, we cannot build a nation with a slave population. The United States of America cannot achieve its dreams and the potential that, it was, that we foresee for it if it is a nation that is being built on the backs of slaves. Hence, there has to be emancipation. You following me? So that's where we are coming out of. But I'm just simply saying that the church was never at the forefront of that movement. The church was on maintaining the status quo. So if we come along now today and says we are going to repaint Jesus and repaint him black, there's going to be an upheaval in our churches, even in today's age of 2017. Why? Because deeply embedded in the whole psyche of our religion is white supremacy. Figured, uh, what would they call it now, um, reinforced by the image that we continue to portray of who? Of Jesus. Yeah? And to show you how subtle this thing is, I remember every year 
No one gets out and you don't hear from any pulpit that Jesus is white. You don't hear that. It's just the images that are your calendars. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. we, we ought to be. We ought. We ought. We ought. We ought to be above that. So that's what we're striving to cultivate and to build here. Yeah? Look at the Pachag website. Look at the back of your, your bulletin. It says the Pachag Church of Christ is a multiracial community of believers. You see that? There's a reason for that being stated here if we read it. <laughs> the idea is that we keep reading it and reinforcing that. See? And while I'm here as a minister, if we are not careful, this becomes a black congregation. Why will it become that way? Because if the white members don't invite their white friends, then what will happen? Look at how the composition, look at the composition of the congregation now. Are you following me? Look at the composition along racial lines. And I know that it has been shifting since I am here. And why is that? Because, you know, people from the community come in and say, wow, they have a black preacher. <laughs> so what's going to happen? People of color start coming. <laughs> you know, so the people, yeah, are you with me? And what about the people, the white folks? An effort. It is, it is, are you with me? It doesn't just happen like that because we, we live in an imperfect world. Many of our congregations are now on this island here of Long Island. You will find that they are what? They are white congregations. There is segregation in our churches on, on Long Island. Brother Field and his wife, you know, over there at Roosevelt. What does he say? So we are the, we are the, we are, what is it? Yeah, we, are the, we are the salt. We are the salt in this congregation of pepper. <laughs> you know what I'm saying to you? Probably have one or two white families, congregation of two or three hundred members. Just simply saying that, look, multiracial congregations don't just happen. We have to work at it. And in working at it, we have to overcome the symbols that are embedded in our community and the thinking of the people in our community. To reverse the order of things. Yeah, we have to work at it. So we have been working at it, and that's pr pretty cool. I'm, you know, I'm not knocking us here at all. I'm very proud of the congregation here. But it's just giving you the facts. Yeah, that's how it is. And so, I don't longer accept calendars with a white Jesus on it. In fact, I accept nothing at all with any emblem of Jesus. Are you with me? And if you notice, I, I have a chain, but there's no cross on it. <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm saying? I don't do anything to reinforce all of the, the images, the cross images. So, in closing out, we had asked the question, there are only two divine images that the Lord authorized. What are they? Yes? The communion. The unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. The body and blood of Jesus Christ. Outside of that, you are on. That's it. Now, having said that, I'm not going to fuss with churches like, you know, on the, the pulpit here, or here they will have, like here they will have a cross. Are you with me? Some of our pews will have crosses on them. I, I'm not, it doesn't matter to me, but I'm just saying that. Yes, Sam.
Yeah, yeah. And, and you see, the, the baptism is a, it's a physical thing, yes, but it's a little different. But the communion emblem is each week. That's it. That's it. It's to remind us, yeah? No, we don't take it. No, I, I tell you what I see folks do. Hey, my brother, how are you? Yeah? I tell you what I see folks do. You know, little kids, especially when they're four, five, six, and, you know, they're, they're, they're full of energy. You know, one, one member says to me, says, you know, my grandson, he's so, he, he's so, his behavior is so poor. So she, when, when the communion is coming around, she makes sure she gives him the, the communion. What is she thinking? It's going to change his behavior. <laughs> you with me? So that's just as bad as the, 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 the serpent of brass 700 years later. The communion is not for kids. It's for baptized believers. And it doesn't have any magical power. <laughs> Are you with me? It's not going to change the behavior of, um, of your children. And it doesn't change your behavior unless you believe in whom? In Jesus and you have obeyed your Jesus. Yeah? The emblems in of themselves don't have any power. You know, the church went, to, went through two to three hundred years debating that issue. In what way is the bread represented the body of Jesus Christ and the fruit of the vine, his blood? You have a whole lot of <laughs> things wrapped around that. The church, actually the church divided on that. See? So, we just simply spend, we have spent all of this time on the matter of images. Strong, powerful. Let us get our minds wrapped around Jesus the Christ. As, serp, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so Jesus must be lifted up that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. That's who we are to believe in. That's what we are to believe in. It's in Jesus Christ. And we believe in him by submitting to him, which means we obey his word and we live by his teachings. Yes. No. Well, actually, let me, let me back up. Let me back up. Let me back up. Let me back up. The, 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 the description that I know of him is in Isaiah 53. Yeah? Revel yeah. In, well, you have other images of him as king, as a lion, as, you know, and so forth. But as, the, as Jesus, as a person on earth, Isaiah 53 says that, first of all, he wasn't a handsome guy. So he, he wasn't a striking figure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Possible, possible. Yeah. Um, he wasn't a striking figure. So... The, the, the importance of that means is this, that you would go to Jesus not because of how he looked, but because of what he did and what he taught. <laughs> you with me? When we see him, when we see him, Isaiah says, there is no beauty that we would desire him. Yeah? So we are going to come to him based upon what he teach, what he taught, his teachings, and certainly the power that he displayed. It says, yes, or as, as Thomas says, yes, my Lord and my God. Yeah? He's not going to be a Hollywood figure. Yes, sir. His essential nature, his divine nature. No, we have his divine nature. Yeah? Yeah? That's what it is, yeah? So we emulate Jesus, not by the way he looked, but by the life that he lived. Yes, brother. Yeah. 
Yes. That's right. And yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 But I thought you were going to say something like Santa Claus. Well, 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 we won't, uh, you know, we won't go there. But um, it's the same kind of imagery, you know, you know, you know, the same kind of imagery. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's uh, the, the, the Europeanization of history is an interesting thing to look at, you know, interesting thing to look at. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Idols. Yeah. And to the world, that's what they are. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they are. And, uh, you know, so, you know, we, we, are, we are in the world, but we're not of the world. The Lord says we are to come out from among, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. Okay. Okay, next week, the Lord willing, we, we, I, I was hoping, I had planned for us to get into um, the battle of Moab. Very interesting matter there. So, finish chapter 21 and also the, um, the, the other aspect of chapter 21 there, the um, Balak. Balak. But anyway, um, I hope you found the discussion profitable. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Um, who's going to, Jamal, you want to lead us in our closing prayer? Well, yeah, I guess so. Um, we have our prayer, prayer request. You know, we close out the same way each week. Um, you know, do, where do you stand before God? Is Jesus Christ the idol of your heart? Yeah? If you'd like to make a prayer request, then please, we have the request forms ready. Uh, we're going to ask, oh, we're going to ask Brother Jamal to lead us in our closing prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Um, I had the idea, where's John, of us having the men's breakfast here at the church on Saturday, Saturday morning. Does that sound good? I'm sorry? Oh, you're hosting it? Well, no, I didn't hear. I hadn't heard of any. Um, the word hasn't reached. It certainly didn't reach me. But we, so there, there's a reason I, we, we need to have five, at least five brothers are needed to be here Saturday at midday to unload a truck of supplies for the pantry. So, um, you know, the, um, some food stuff, the food stuff is coming on Saturday at about midday, and they said we should try to have five brothers so that it can be unloaded quickly and expeditiously. So I thought, okay, that being the case, let's have men's breakfast here, and then the men will be here, <laughs> you know. So uh, I'm putting that out. Otherwise, we'll still need volunteers to be here at midday Saturday. Um, sir? Well, we were just going to put it in the hallway. Um, and then, you know, temporary too. But, but the, the stuff will be here on Saturday, so we have to, after we do that, then we have to find a solution to the pantry room. <laughs> yeah? So what is, are we saying? We, men's, do we have breakfast here? Who will be here? Who can be here Saturday morning? Three, one, two, three. Tom probably will be saying yes, four. Mike, can you be here Saturday? Not sure? Yeah? Brothers, Saturday? Yeah, Saturday? Okay, Saturday? Saturday? You working? Saturday? Not sure? Okay, 
um, I'll, I'll, I'll send out the word on our system, emergency system. So Saturday, what, 9 or 10 o'clock? 11, that's, 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 yeah. Okay, so what about 10? So that way we have a little fellowship too. Okay. Uh, 11 you're sort of gone into from, move from breakfast to brunch. <laughs> yeah? Or, or what we're saying? If we say 10 is about 10.30, we're going to get going anyway. Yeah? So um, who is going to cook breakfast? Lynn? Yeah. <laughs> Sir? We're coming to service. <laughs> okay, so anyway, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have to get on the phone and uh, get, you know, we don't. Yeah? Yeah, all right. So um, we usually bring, bring breakfast with you, bring some stuff, but, and um, we will need two brothers to probably do scrambled eggs, do some cooking here, eggs and bacon, uh, well, bacon and, uh, and turkey bacon, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, yeah. Okay, let us bow our heads. Brother Jamal, lead us, please.
Amen. Thank you. I love you with the love of the Lord. I love you with the love of the Lord. I see in you.